Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Next to Madison. On today's episode next to me is a amazing woman. She is uh, an author of some very successful books. She is also a professional public speaker and is also the founder of a website called winthisfight.org. And it is a website to help fight and combat human trafficking, which is such a huge issue going on right now. So with that being said, I want to bring on my amazing guest, Mitzi Perdue. How are you? What a joy to be here. And I'm to be with so your- excited. I grew up eating Purdue chicken. You're a good woman. I <laughs> So I guess we have to talk about that now. So you are, you're Purdue because you married into... I married Frank Purdue. Yes. And it, and he was the son of the founder or the grandson of the founder? Uh, he was the person who made Purdue Chicken famous. He was the one that you would have seen in the ads in the 1970s, 80s, 90s. Oh, wow. That's and, amazing. Yeah. And he was known for, for decades as the world's premier marketer. Yeah. Because he, he did something that nobody had ever done before. He created a branded commodity. People used okay. to say that if you if you advertise a commodity, it's you know it's just pouring money down the drain. Right. And he thought that can't be true, and so he began advertising Purdue Chicken. Wow. So this was in his family. His right? father. His father had started it, but when okay. his, when he joined his father, it was a father and son operation. Wow. There were no employees when Frank first started. By the time of his passing, he employed 20,000 people. Not am- and it's still such a strong brand today. Well, we've just, we're in the middle of our 100th anniversary, and I'm so proud of that I could burst. I know, it is, because you just think of chicken, you think of Purdue chicken. <laughs> As like, I, I don't, said, I can't really think of like a lot of other brands of chicken. Well, don't. It's a very bad <laughs> idea to think of the other brands. <laughs> this is true. Purdue chicken, it is. They do not endorse us, but we are <laughs> we are endorsing them, right? Yay. So, but I want to go back a little bit because you wrote a book. I, I think it was one of your first books because you actually were born into a very wealthy family, the family that started the Sheridan Hotels. So when what year did the Sheridan chain start? It started in the early 1930s. Okay. So was that that was obviously after the Gilded Age and um so was it started by your your grandparents? No, my father. Your, your father. My wow. father and my uncle. Not amazing. So you grew up like in a very successful family. I did, and it was yeah. really clear to me that it was a successful family because we had a big house and right. <laughs> that had a ballroom. That's a, that's a sign. Yes. Yeah. As, as Sherlock Holmes would say, that's a clue. That is a clue. They always say in New York City, you're rich if you have a dining room table. You're <laughs> super rich if you have a ballroom. <laughs> well, at his death, he had 400 hotels. And, you know, an amazing coincidence. This is true. I mean, if I were writing a novel, I wouldn't dare say this because it would be unbelievable. But my father started with no employees. Uh-huh. At the time of his death, he employed 20,000 people. And it's the same story as Frank Perdue had. It's great. They both were at 20,000 at the time of their death. That's yeah. amazing. But the other thing is, they had so many ideas on management and growth that were just identical. And it was just, you know, it's kind of amazing to me that I would be with two people who had ideas that were so similar. And if I may, let me give you one of them. Okay. If you had asked my father, what was the secret of your success? He would have answered you, and I know this is his answer because he wrote it in one of his books. His success was because of the people who worked for him at every level. Yes. Now, if you had asked Frank Perdue exactly the same thing, uh huh, he would have given the same answer. And so both men put extraordinary amounts of effort into valuing and encouraging and just bringing forward the people who worked with them. Isn't that amazing? So what was, did your did your father come from like a wealthy family before he started Sheridan or was he self-made? He was utterly self-made. My grandfather was a historian. So what And, do you... and they, they don't make rich, well, maybe today they do, but back <laughs> then they don't make rich historians. I still don't think they do. Um, but the thing is, what do you think that his mindset was to become so wealthy and successful? Because they say a lot of wealth is all in our mindset. You, you, if you took, if you took a billionaire and you took all his money away, it wouldn't be very long before he had it back or she had it back. 
Well, I remember being really impressed by my father on that subject of mindset. Uh-huh. I remember I was, I, I could have been like eight years old, and we, we had a country house, and I watched him chopping wood. And I was really surprised because I was aware that he was a big famous people and people, you know, fussed over him and that he yeah. was a famous person. And here while he was chopping wood, and if you're if you've chopped a lot of wood, there's a rhythm to it where you know, you swing the axe and and it goes in and then you swing again. And he obviously had done it lots and lots. And you know, even at eight years old I could tell that this man knew what he was doing. Yeah. <laughs> So I asked him, uh, what are you doing chopping wood? You could pay somebody to do that. And he said, first of all, he enjoyed it. And second, he felt that if he lost every penny that he had, that it wouldn't rearrange his mental furniture because he felt that he could start over again and he wasn't afraid of hard work. Is that not cool? Uh, mind blown. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I loved it. It's a no. I, I I just got the chills. Oh, thank you. Because it's so true. If if it's you know it's it is in that mindset. So when he did, do, are you an only child or do you? No, have, there are five of us. There's five of you. So how did he keep you guys grounded? One of the things that he did, which I just cherish. I mean, to me, it's worth more than inheriting a diamond tiara. Which yeah. trust me, I've not inherited a diamond tiara. <laughs> But you give me a choice of a great big historic diamond tiara and what I'm about to describe. I'll okay. take what I'm about to describe. Okay. Okay, so we came from a family of wealth. He wanted to make sure that all his children at least had a few years of public school. And I treasure that because I think, you know, I, I, I went to a combination of public schools and private schools. And I have a suspicion that a lot of the people who only went to private schools uh, had lived unnecessarily in a bubble because when I was going to public school, right. I had the huge privilege that I'm grateful to for the rest of my life of you know, one of my closest friends, Dickie Hallett, his father was a policeman. Yeah. Uh, or one of my closest girlfriends. And this is like seventh grade, eighth grade. Uh -huh. One of my closest girlfriends, uh, Peggy Flynn, her parents were dairymen. And I just loved it because yeah. und under what other circumstance, if I were going exclusively to... Right. Uh, I mean, I I just value that. It, it, uh, well, it that made you realize that, you know, there's all different walks of life and, you know, that you have... Well, how about... I'll, I'll give you an example of okay. where it, it pays off for me okay. even today. Uh -huh. I'm a huge admirer of law enforcement. Uh, I've, I've, yes. In fact, something that I'm really proud of right now, there's a magazine called Police One. Okay. And I'd written an article about uh, things that I had seen with a close friend of mine who is in law enforcement. And they published it. And I'm thinking, if I weren't an admirer of law enforcement and had friends who were in law enforcement, I wouldn't be published in a global magazine called Police One. Yay. Yes, I know. Because that is a hard job. I mean... You don't get paid that much, and you're putting. I mean, I mean, you. I go to work, and I'm usually. I'm not going to die when I get home. <laughs> exactly. I mean, they're there you to know? protect and serve, and they put their lives on the line for us. And they deserve more credit. They really do. All the credit in the world. Yeah. I love them. Yeah. Well, but God, I wonder. I wonder if I would, if it would have been as easy for me to make friends with some of my friends in law enforcement. If one of my best friends as a child hadn't had a father who was a policeman. That could have been it. Yeah, and if you were just surrounded and you didn't know any anything else. Like you didn't see like the difference and the But I think that that's great what he did. And did any of your brothers or sisters go off the deep end because of the wealth? No, I thought oh well, here's another thing that, that my father used to say to any of us. You know, when we wanted something, uh -huh. he would say in a very low, stern voice, earn it. And and so, you know, if, wow. if, if I wanted, you know, whatever I wanted, uh, it was generally earn it. Well, and, yeah, because he did it. Yeah, and yeah. We, yeah, we had allowances. We we did chores. Uh-huh. Uh, so I can't swear how grounded I am or aren't, but, right. I, <laughs> but I think I'm... <laughs> I'm more grounded than I might have been if my if my parents. Is, well, they were yeah. very concerned about having uh, spoiled children, and and so uh, you know I'm I'm a hotel heiress. Father had four hundred hotels, but yeah. growing up, you know, my clothes were hand me downs. Okay, uh, so you had a very normal 
upbringing, which well, is probably why close, you're so humble and close to normal. Close to <laughs> <laughs> well, so what do you think of Paris Hilton? Uh, I would love to meet her. I th- okay. Uh, well, if you can arrange that. Well, I, I, I mean, maybe. Lynette, <laughs> no, no, you're, but, you're on it. <laughs> no, but, but I'm absolutely fascinated by her because uh, she had such a different background from mine. Such a di- Yes. Uh, I mean, we were, we were supposed mo- – mother's ambition for us was to be good citizens. And, and she wanted us you – know, something that she would tell us all the time as we were growing up, put back in the bucket – and what she meant, I, th- I don't know if that's immediately clear, but her feeling was, you know, what we were given, we had to give back. And so it was very much about giving back. And, well, as I said, she wanted us to be good citizens. Well, right. Absolutely. You got to give to those that are less fortunate, you know, and you'll still have plenty. And then my father, he had such uh, almost, I'm, I'm wondering, searching for the word, whether it's idealistic, but let me share with you. Something of my father's approach to life. Oh, okay. And it has to do with when he would be, when he'd take over a new hotel. And we're talking the 1930s and pretty much during the height of the Great Depression. Because Sheraton Hotels began during the Great Depression because nobody could make money on a hotel when nobody had any money to stay at a hotel. Right. And so he could buy hotels, you know, at that were teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. And when he'd buy a hotel, the first thing that he would do when he took possession that day, he would invite all the people who worked at the hotel. And, you know, there might be seven or 800 of them. And he'd invite them all into the ballroom of the hotel. Wow. And, and, you know, he'd know ahead of time that he was dealing with some really demoralized people because at the height of the Great Depression, yeah, it's hard for us to believe today, but there was 25% unemployment. And if you lost your job, you know, you're almost certainly not going to find another, and it, it meant the bread line. Ugh. Well, so he knew that when a hotel's teetering on the edge of bankruptcy, everybody's worried about their jobs. Right. And not only that, when somebody has taken over, you know, when there's new ownership, they probably have their cousins and uncles who are going to take the jobs of the people who already have the jobs. Yes. So Father would mount the stage, look out over his audience, and his the first words out of his mouth were, every one of you keeps your job. And then he explained why. He said, I believe in you. I know that you know this hotel better than anybody else in the world. You know your job better than anybody else. I know that my job is to give you the resources and the encouragement and the support to show the world just how good you are. Because here's what's going to happen. What's going to happen is, in a few months, this is going to be the most popular hotel in the city. It's going to be the most successful. It's going to be the most financially secure. And the reason is you. Because I believe in you. And as I said, my job is to allow you to show the rest of the world how good you are. Your father is like a saint. Well, but, Oh, my gosh. But how about it paid off? Because what he, among the things he was famous for is if you started working with him, you probably worked for him for life because he valued you. Oh. And, and let me tell you what, what would happen next. And for the moment, I want you okay. and our listeners okay. to imagine that you're in that audience. And you've heard this really idealistic talk. And, you know... You, at the moment, you're kind of top of the world because you're not worried about going home to your spouse and thinking, how am I going to put food on the table? How am I going to pay the rent? Right. Your job is secure, and, and your jo- your boss believes in you. Uh, but that's just the beginning because okay. so far it's just been talk. Right. Here's what you see. You come back to work the next day, and you don't have this horrible feeling of dread, but you know it's still the hotel's been teetering on bankruptcy. Uh-huh. And you watch, there's a whole cavalcade of like plumbers and electricians and decorators and they're coming into the hotel. And you understand that because if a hotel has been in bankruptcy, you know, it's, it's, it needs refurbishing. Uh-huh. You know, the, the carpets are stained, the curtains are frayed. But then you notice in amazement that all these people, all these people who are refurbishing the hotel, they're not going to the areas that the public sees. No, 
They're going to the employee dining room, the employee showers, the employee lockers, even the rickety old elevators. And the first, the first money that father ever spent on a hotel was in the areas that only the employees would see. To keep him happy. Yeah, so I asked him, why, why did you do that? And here was his answer, and I memorized it. Uh-huh. He said, you, know, you want the people who work for you, or actually he would have put it, you want the people who work with you. Uh-huh. You want them to feel valued, but you also want them uh, to kind of work together as a team. And so how do you go about that? And he said, uh, persuasion comes in three flavors. He said, I could have stood up in front of them that first day and said, shape up or you're fired. But he didn't. Right. Because he said, you can get compliance. You can get people to do what, what you want, but it's going to be grudging. They're going to do it, you know, as the minimal to get by. He yeah, said, okay, that makes sense, yeah. Okay, so he was against intimidation, which is, you know, shape up or you're fired. Uh, right. The next approach is, as he called it, bribery. Bribery is, hey, do a great job, and uh, there's a raise in it for you. There's a bonus. But he said the problem with that is it's utterly transactional. The problem with that is uh, they're going to work for the reward rather than uh, the good of the whole, whole hotel. They're, you know, it's, it's, it's like a Makes bargain. Sense. yeah, right. So what do you do? And he said the approach that he favored was, and I love this, I invite you to memorize it, here goes. Okay. Inspire, don't require. And so what he wanted everybody who wow. was working with him was to think, I'm not a maid making beds, I'm not a bartender, you know, serving drinks. I'm not a bellman carrying baggage. No, what I'm really here for is to make this the most, best hotel in the city, the best served, the most popular, the most successful. And so... Unbelievable. Uh, yeah, he said, you know, if you know the why, you'll figure out the how. Yes, that's and true. And the why is we're making this the best hotel in the city. And he said, when people have a vision that's he said the essence of leadership is to give people a better vision of themselves. Did he ever write a book? Uh, yeah, he did. What was, what's the name of his book called? It's called The World of Mr. Sheraton. Wow. What year did that come out? It uh, came out in 1959, and it's not in print any longer. But, but he did tell some of, of the kind of philosophy that I'm describing. Oh, my. I mean, it's amazing. So where was the very first hotel? Was it in New York? It was, no, because actually the, Sher the Sheraton headquarters, where it started, was in Boston. And uh, Oh, I did not know that. And I believe the first one might have been in Cambridge. But a, a story that, that I kind of like to tell, if you'll allow me, because I think of you'll course. enjoy it. Oh, my gosh. Abs this is your platform. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> hey, have I landed in heaven or what? <laughs> you, I, uh, well... I hope it's a lot better than this, but it's pretty good. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. But but the story I wanted to share with you, if you ever see a Sheraton Hotel, okay. and by the way, we did sell the whole chain when he died, so I don't have a personal stake in it. But nevertheless, how the name Sheraton got his name, because father's name was Henderson. Oh. And the third hotel he ever bought was in Springfield, Massachusetts. And this we're talking the early 1930s. And neon signs <clears throat> had just come into, uh, I wouldn't say popularity, but into use. And they were terribly expensive and very modern and amazing. And the hotel in Springfield had a $10,000 neon sign that said Sheraton. Well, for advertising purposes, Father really wanted to have one name for all the hotels. I mean, it's a lot easier to have an ad say, stay at Sheraton, rather than, and then name off a whole lot of hotels. Right. <clears throat> so, uh, as a good New England Yankee, he couldn't bear <laughs> to tear down a $10,000 sign. Right. And then, and that was, you know, in today's dollars, that might be a $200,000 sign. Right. Yeah, 10000 10, is still a lot of money, but yeah, back then, oh my gosh. Well, uh he, he did name it Sheraton, and there were two reasons to do that, both of which I admire. One is he was frugal, 
Uh-huh. And by the way, we were so brought up to be frugal, but, but back to Sheraton okay. and the name. Uh, the other reason was he felt that Henderson wasn't euphonious. It didn't sound beautiful, and he thought Sheraton sort of had a much nicer ring to it. And I just loved that he ha- didn't have such a big ego that he had to put his name on them, that he would recognize that a nicer sounding name was the way to go. Yes, absolutely. Wow. So this was, so he started, it was the third hotel he called the Sheridan because the neon sign? Well, it already had a a neon sign when he bought it that said Sheridan. So he decided that was it. So so let's use it for all the hotels. That is amazing. And then it just kept growing and growing and... Well, because I think his magic sauce, secret sauce was the persuasion of getting people to have a better vision of themselves. And repeat that again that he said, inspire, don't require. Exactly. I love that. And I think every, you know, business entrepreneur, business person, I think, or anyone in a leadership, it's it's so true. Yeah, and I I feel that, you know, there was a lot of wisdom that back then that, uh, you know, I've, I've had people tell me that it seems to me just kind of normal and commonplace what I'm describing because I grew up with it. But I've had people, you know, tell me that that his brilliance in figuring out this was like rocket science almost. Well, yeah. I mean, the thing is that, that I'm thinking is how did he find – how did he get the money to buy the first hotel in the Depression? Oh, I'll, I'll give you the answer to that. Uh, he and my uncle and then his roommate from college, they pooled the money that they had gotten from war bon- bonuses when they served in, in World War I. And when they put it all together, they had a thousand dollars. Oh my gosh! And they used that to make some smaller investments, uh, but he never really made it big until he was in his mid thirties. I mean, he was sort of bumbling along. And what year was that? Oh, uh, well, his... see, he was. I think we're talking early nineteen thirties when when his first real success came his way. Oh my gosh! And so, where where was home that you grew up in Boston? Boston. Okay, where about where in Boston? Lewisburg Square. Where's that? Oh, uh, it's on Beacon Hill, and okay. Does the house still exist today? Yeah, it does. Oh. And I don't know who lives there, but I hope they're happy because I had a happy childhood. Does it still have a ballroom? Oh, uh, actually. Oh my gosh, that was one of our other houses. <laughs> oh, the other house. Oh, okay, wrong house. <laughs> <laughs> well, for where I grew up and went to school was Boston, and okay, uh, it was a house, but that one didn't have a ballroom. Where was the house of the ballroom? Uh, Dublin, New Hampshire, and it's still there, and we still own it. Oh, nice. What year was that built? Nineteen hundred. Oh my gosh, so was that part of the Gilded Age, right in the nineteen hundreds when it was built? It was built. I'm not sure. I, I think of the Gilded Age as maybe the 1880s, 1890s. Yeah. This might have been the tail end of it because I guess there it must have been fairly gilded if there's a ballroom that holds 200. I, I know. Because who was the original builder of it? Was somebody that, that you guys, you bought it from somebody? Uh, here's a story. In the, around 1900, Washington, D.C. did not have air conditioning. So Washington, D.C. was known as a hardship post because, you know, really hot, sweltering summers, no air conditioning. Mm-hmm. So the whole government would move to what they called the Hill Country. And the Hill Country was Dublin, New Hampshire, on the ridge of Mount Monadnock. And it was, you know, cool and breezy and nice. And wow. the Secretary of the Treasury, Franklin McVeigh, built this house, and a couple of presidents used to have it as their summer White House. Oh, my gosh. So it must be just be beautiful. It's crazy beautiful. How often do you get up there? Uh, my si- sister lives there full time. I'm there probably, I don't know, maybe three weeks a year. That's it? Well, I would, I'd love to be there full time. Right. But <laughs> yeah, you're busy. <laughs> <laughs> That's, true. That's true. I forgot. It's not that close, right? So um, then you, so let's fast forward after that. Then you meet your husband. Mm-hmm. So how did you guys, who was Frank Perdue? Chicken. 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 Um, he's not a chicken. He's just the chicken family. Um, how did you guys meet? We met in Washington, D.C., and the year was 1988. And I was living in California uh, growing rice. I mean, you can tell by my voice and, and my attitude that I'm a rice farmer, right? How did you get into <laughs> rice farming? Well, doesn't every Boston debutant want to be a rice farmer? 
No. No? Oh. <laughs> but I like what <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll tell you briefly how that happened. My father died when I was fairly young. I was 26. And oh. it, was, it was unexpected. He had a heart attack and, uh, well, it was unexpected. Yeah. But suddenly I came into a great, big, huge fortune. Yeah. At 26. Oh, my gosh. But since uh, since we had been brought up with the idea that you be you're frugal and that you don't spend, it's okay to spend your income, but you don't spend the principal. Yes. And that, I mean, to this day, I go coach class. Uh, I came here by bus, uh, because we were brought up to be frugal and and not to live in a bubble. Right. No, that makes sense. Okay, so here I have this great big huge fortune. Yeah. And I thought, you know, I. I could just put it in the stock market. Mm-hmm. And by the way, the huge fortune came because we sold 400 hotels. Wow. Because we sold them at my father's death. Yeah. But I thought it would be much more interesting and much more responsible uh, to invest it in land, in farmland. I was living in California at the time. And I spent four years taking agricultural courses at the University of California at Davis. Uh, it was... Uh, you're sitting next to somebody who knows more than you'd expect about agronomy, rural appraisal, agricultural you're accounting. You're like such an. I'm just like sitting here with my mouth open because I'm like, you're so inspiring and like so, like oh, just thank amazing. You. You're like, and then I was a rice farmer. <laughs> I was like, what? All right. Well, so I spent I spent four years studying uh, everything that I could. I mean, I also ended up knowing more about finance than I ever expected. Right. Um, because these things I, I bought, well, where do I start in all of this? Yeah. You, you asked me how I met Frank. Yes. I, okay, I was growing rice, and I had been growing rice for about maybe, oh, I guess probably 12 years. Okay. <clears throat> well, I met him at a party that I'd been invited to in Washington, D.C. And in 1988, his advertisements didn't reach California, so I didn't know who he was. Ah. Oh. And at this party, there there was another wrinkle to it, which is I had to leave early, and he arrived late, and we only overlapped by 10 minutes. But we decided that rice and chicken would go well together and decided to marry. They go great together. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we decided wow. to marry. So that was fate right yeah. there. Oh, my God. So did you, do you still have the land now? Yeah. Well, no, actually, I, I still own land in California, but we've transitioned from uh, rice into wine grapes. But wow. when, when Frank and I married, it really was a kind of speedy relationship because I told you we overlapped by 10 minutes. Uh huh. But the first five minutes of it were spent talking about how we'd both been divorced, how we would never, ever consider the possibility of the notion of, of remarriage. And that was the first five minutes. And then the second five minutes... We started talking about how it was really unfortunate that we'd never remarry because that meant growing old alone. But that was our fate because neither of us would ever trust anybody again. And then he looked down at me and he said, I believe I could trust you. And I looked up at him and said, I believe I could trust you. And then we spent the next four minutes talking about what our marriage would be like. And what our marriage would be like would be, it would be supportive and not competitive and would be there for each other for the good times and the bad times. And that's just how it was. And when we married... Oh, my gosh. When we married, uh, we had a long-distance relationship. But when we actually married, you know, said our I do's, mm-hmm. I'd known him six weeks and three days. Oh, my gosh. Was there a prenup involved on both sides? Yep. But that that was just easy. The, the yeah. prenup was the simplest thing in the world. I won't touch yours. He won't touch mine. <laughs> Money, not privates. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> naughty, naughty, naughty. We sorry. love it. <laughs> Don't be sorry. I, I, I yield to nobody for, for naughtiness. <laughs> you set me up. I had to just Woo-hoo. throw it in there. That's amazing. So um, is he still, does he have like heirs that run the uh, yes. chicken company? It's still yeah. a family run business? We have our 100th anniversary this year. Okay. And his son runs it. And something that I'm really, really proud of, I had two sons from, or have two sons from a previous marriage. I was going to say, oh, (laughs) okay, they're still alive, good. (laughs) Oh, yes. (laughs) And uh, the families blended so well 
that that my son was appointed by his stepbrother after Frank's death to be vice president. Oh, isn't that awesome? Yeah, and and because to me it's somewhat unexpected that that stepbrothers would get along so well that they'd work together all day long. I know. So he had one son and you have two? Exactly. Okay, so it was three boys. Uh, my other son, he's he's an inventor and he's living in Texas and deep into artificial intelligence. Wow. I don't even know what that... I know what that means, but like... It's yeah, so, brainy. <laughs> yeah, right. Is he working on some of the robots and... Well, he's done something that is a little unusual. To get a patent, he owns three patents, mm-hmm. but his fourth patent wasn't made by a human being. It was made by one of his artificial brains. Oh, my God. So he's obviously, like, genius level. I mean, that's insane. Okay, proud mummy thinks so, but yeah. probably not true. Well, I can tell you that I can't build a robot. I know that <laughs> right now. I would say I'm smart, but mm, nope, mm-hmm. couldn't do it. That's well, where guess my what? blonde comes in. Well, <laughs> not a chance that I could do what he's doing. <laughs> that's amazing. And so where's Purdue based? Salisbury, Maryland. Okay, so that's where the headquarters are? And that's where I live, yes. That's where you live? Mm-hmm. Oh, gotcha. Okay, so I, why did I think you were in New York City for some Oh, reason? because I love spending time in New York. Love oh. it, love it, love it, love it. And then on top of that, I love it some more. Yes, so you just get to come up here and enjoy? Yeah, and get my fix of the energy and the fun here. I, well, you've got so much. I just love your energy. You've got amazing energy. So, But I want to talk about your book, the family book. Um, you, it, the, the book is... You tell us the name of the book. It's the well, there's the, uh, with the family money and okay. I have I have one on a biography of Frank Purdue. Okay, and that's business and life lessons from him because he was he was a genius on a scale that's just hard to fathom. Yeah, I mean he had such insight. But I also wrote a book. It's called How to Make Your Family Business Last. And yes, my expertise for that is I mentioned my father and the Hendersons. And although grandfather was a historian, so father started out basically kind of penniless, Uh the family business actually began in 1840, and it's never not been run by a Henderson. To this day, it is run by a Henderson. And let's see if I can do math in my head fast enough. 180 years Uh of the Henderson Estate Company. So what did they start in? They, They started in real estate, in New York, as a matter of fact. Okay. But... It's interesting that a family business can stay in the family and go off in all sorts of different directions, but the family stays together. I and mean, that's remarkable because you think, like, you know, when a lot of money gets involved, it brings out some sides of people that are not good. Oh, I've seen that so often. In fact, I wrote the book. Okay, a quick story? Yes. Mm, I hope I don't make any enemies with this story, but there was, nope. a, there was a group that I was part of and loved dearly called the Famous Last Names Club. And these were names, I, you know, part of the vow was that we would never reveal who else was there, but they had famous last names, or we had famous last names. So like Vanderbilt, Rockefeller? I'm I'm not going to tell. Okay, no problem. (laughs) (laughs) Just making an educated guess. (laughs) Um, And and I'm not going to comment, even though I'm dying to. (laughs) It's okay. Okay, so let's get the juice without the name. All right. Okay, so every six weeks or so, would meet and would would talk about what it's like to have a famous last name. And most of us all really enjoyed it. Uh But one week, the topic was, how well do you get along with your siblings? And we went around the table, and of 16 people, how about that I was the only one who really, really enjoyed my siblings? I'd hear stories about how... Like one woman, her two brothers were squeezing her out of the company by just not telling her when the meetings were. Uh, And another where, uh, let's see, I guess there had been divorces and mixed families and they all hated each other. And another one confessed to the group that the pain that she gets from from what her siblings caused her permeated every hour of every day. And I'm thinking, OMG. That's so different for me because in both the families that I'm part of, you know, the, the greatest happiness I have is how much I love my siblings or, or my relatives. Right. And so uh, yeah, it was a little awkward when it came around to me because everybody had been telling 
how how awful it was and you know it's, yes. I, I didn't want to to say hey everybody I'm different so I just sort of went mumble 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 and didn't say much okay but it did leave me yeah you know, as as I was walking away from that lunch I'm thinking what did my family do right that where we enjoy each other and so I wrote the book based on watching two families that I mean we're not we're far from perfect but but um I mean I know of families that where where there've been murders I know of a family where I it, and I know this family quite well where uh, one of the one of the brothers got really mad at another brother and I mean hard to believe but he knew where all the uh illegal things were and called in uh, the law and got his brother jailed. Oh my gosh! And so, while well, my fam, my two families, we are not perfect, but um, nobody sent anybody to jail or murdered anybody. Right, that's that's a good step. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, co- in, in comparatively, I, I think we're doing really well. Yes. So, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you instill values that help people stay together? Yes. And. My theory on on all families, wealthy or not families, every family that exists has a culture. And by culture, I mean the way we do things. You know, what you think is right, what you think is wrong, you have a culture. But is it a culture where somebody put a lot of thought into it, or did it just come about? And the conclusion I get from years of studying this is that the families that put a lot of thought into the culture they develop uh, are much more likely to last. And as an example, wow. with the Hendersons, yeah, we, we have dozens of, of, of values that we really live by, but let's start with that relationships are more important than money. Mm-hmm. Uh, or another one, a, a really big one, and I think the Purdue's do the same thing, but we call it by different names. In, in the uh, Henderson family, for family quarrels, we're really big on the idea that if you've got a beef, get it out, tell it. Uh, if you have to yell, yes. scream about it, do. You know, don't sweep anything under the carpet. Hundred percent. Oh, but but there's another side to that, which is you're allowed to yell and scream or or curse <laughs> or whatever you do if you're not being heard. But the one rule is we don't wash our dirty linen in public. We can argue among ourselves, but to the world, a united front. Right. And that was really put to the test when, when my father died. And, you know, again, we're all in shock because nobody expected a heart attack to right. take him at age 70. Ugh. Well, there was the argument over do we sell the company or not. And there were five of us, and it's our tradition to solve things by consensus. But you know, part of the family was thinking, no, don't sell. That's... You know, it would be an insult to our father. It would be nobody's going to care about the employees as much as we do. Oh, his legacy. You know, just yeah. don't do it. Okay. While other members of my siblings were had very reasonable reasons why it should be sold. But when you have a quarrel that involves identity, and, you know, if you're part of a family business, that's a big part of your identity. Of course. So identity arguments are some of the bitterest and worst that, that exist. Mm-hmm. And as I said, the feelings were white hot. Oh my God, yeah. But our tradition was that we don't take our family quarrels public. And so nobody went to a lawyer, nobody went to the press, yet we kept our disagreements. Oh. And thank heaven, because if we had been public about it, by the time you, you take a, a quarrel public or go to lawyers it's awfully hard to turn back it is no that's absolutely right and it's Wh- amazing it, that you guys were all on the same page to well, respect each other and love each other that way well i was impressed by yeah you know, looking back on it that we did come to a consensus we did decide to sell the hotels and you know it was it really did it, it, it was like a year of mourning from my point of view because Everything that I thought I was, you know, hotel heiress. Yeah. I'm not anymore. Right. <laughs> so, so it was, uh, so anybody who's listening who's thinking of selling their company, uh, 
there's a big price to be paid in identity. But the reward for us of coming to a consensus was this year we will be celebrating our 130th annual reunion. And oh my God! And I, d- I don't think you know if we had had a great big public quarrel, I don't know how it would be put together, and we wouldn't be enjoying each other still. So, how many people go to this event or this reunion? Mm, about seventy-five. How fun! Oh, and it's so cool how because fun. These, yeah, these are these are cousins that you've seen growing up. In my in my case, uh, I'm not shy about my age. I'm seventy-eight. You look I've been, fantastic, yeah. Mitzi. Oh my God! Woohoo! Well, I, I you know, I look at my. My relatives, and it's it's just a high point of my year to see them. Yeah, and how fun it is! But the Purdue's do almost the same thing as far as quarrels. Uh, we have the covenant, and the covenant again is sort of the same thing: argue, but do it privately. Right. So I do have to talk about this because obviously there's a lot of of money involved, and there's three boys. How was it when they got married? Was it was it difficult because you were bringing a stranger into a new family dynamic? Like oh. you didn't know who they were. You didn't know. Wait, are we talking uh, Frank's children? Because he had three Both. daughters. Oh. Both. Any of them. I mean, on either side. Because it's like when you get married and you come from a lot of money, like sometimes it people can get in the way just because they don't know. You know, like obviously there's the prenup, there's this, but – Let's use, for example, the whole Mexit thing. Oh, with the Royals. Actually, I, I so. Oh. What do you think about that? Let's talk about that. Okay, I'm really very, very opinionated, but I know I like it because it's uh, it's so hot right now, and it's it's that interesting thing. You had these Royals that were set up and huge family, and they tried to keep stuff out of the press, and they tried to, and then with Megan coming in, things got. Very, you know, important. The press went after her, poor girl. But I don't know what I think of it. I can't wrap my head around it. But like you can, you kind of came from that world a little bit. Oh, uh, okay. I'm afraid of being really unpopular with what I'm about to say. But here goes. <laughs> All right, here we go. I mean, I was brought up with the idea of duty, mm-hmm. and that uh, that you solved things within the family, and right. and that you and that. Your ego wasn't supposed to get in the way. You're supposed to be unselfish. You're supposed to think of the greater good, that there are things more important than what you want. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, I mean, who knows how any of us would have acted if we were in Megan's situation. But I like to dream and imagine that I would have sucked it up. (laughs) Well, I mean, it seems like it would be everybody's dream to be in that situation, but but I, I but I th- I would I would feel that that I was betraying a whole lot of people if if I let my ego separate me from something bigger than me. Yeah, I mean, I I just still can't believe it. Like they're out, like it's over, and like uh, he doesn't even they don't even live there anymore. Well, I don't think that. I mean, I I. Th- Oh, again, unpopularity, old-fashioned, but here goes. I I want my husband to be happy, and I'm not sure that she's taking her husband on a road that's going to make him happy. She's separating him from his family, from his career. Um, It's going to be very interesting to kind of watch it all unfold. Well, you asked my opinion, and I gave it. No, I I, I mean, I think it's a great opinion, you know, because I don't think... Anyone really knows. I mean, I don't know her, so I don't, I don't know. You know, I don't. I I wish I had the press that she had, not the bad press, but just the press. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. But yeah, you just don't know. But it's what happens when there's a lot of money involved, a lot of people, and you know, it just they're all their scandals became out in the open, and it's like the royal family doesn't really have any privacy anymore. Like that was over, but somebody else came in. And almost well, I'll tell you something else that. that I was brought up with. Uh huh. That since father had a, you know, he was a prominent person, we were we were simply taught from childhood behave in public. I mean, you just yeah. have to. You, yeah, that's true, right? Because it was his reputation too. And then you know, it's your reputation. Well, it, and it it went a little bit farther than that. Even uh, if if let's say taking a quarrel public or misbehaving in public. Uh, we were taught that there were there were twenty thousand employees, there were twenty five thousand stockholders, 
And if we took a quarrel public or did something that was harmful to the name, that it wasn't just about us, that there were others who were going to suffer, including, how about like the lenders, the bankers, the... 100%. Or, or even the health of the community, because a hotel plays a big role as far as the tax base. And so we were just told, don't be selfish. You know, right. this may seem painful or wrong or you're miserable, but suck it up because it's not all about you. Yes, that's true. And, and so again, you know, that gives me a somewhat harsh view of, of Megan. But yeah, I, I, I know it's always that thing is like you just don't know what's going on, but it's kind of like you knew what you were getting into. Or, or even if grown it, up with the royal family. And it's, you know, if you wanted a normal life, marry a normal dude yeah like harry's just not a normal dude and then i mean that in a positive way yeah you know well i wish them happiness and i hope it works out but of course yes but as i said in my imagination and i can't know how i'd really act but in my imagination i think that i would have not done what she did yeah so the book is really so somebody who you know there's all these technology companies and now there's these new this new generation of wealth right like Elon Musk's kids Musk's kids and so would this be a good book for somebody like them to kind of read to kind of keep like advice on how to keep the family together and just kind of how you guys were able to do it to not create so much animosity within the family I would love I'll tell you why I wrote the book okay and it's actually it's for any family but this this is getting back to my story of the famous na- last names club. Uh-huh. I have a mission in life, and that's to increase happiness and decrease misery. And Aww. I saw so much misery that I thought could be avoided when families don't get along. In fact, a question for you. I mean, it's hypothetical. Okay. But of, of the pains that come your way uh-huh. or the joys that come your way, don't they almost all the the really big ones come from your intimate relationships? Yeah, husband, children, father. You know, if when when those are going well, heavenly. Yes. When those those are going badly, it's like my friend said: the pain permeates every hour of every day. Mm-hmm. Well, I would love to, since I've seen examples of things that you can teach families or in family members including that relationships are more important than money. Yes. Uh, if, if, if you're not taught that, if, you know, another thing, we were brought up not to feel jealous. And, uh, you know, how do you teach people not to be jealous? Well, That's amazing. It's, uh, yeah. Well, how I, do I, you? I, I was asking my brother about that because it seems to me that, you know, in, in the family of, like, 75 who come to the to the reunion, uh-huh. some are doing really, really well. Some are struggling. Um, some are, like, Harvard PhDs. Uh, they're ones who have, have, I don't know, have disabilities. And yet they're all welcome in the family. And I was asking my brother, uh, how is it that we rejoice for each other or we're there for each other and we're not jealous of each other. And he said that our parents, you know, they, they never had, like, favorites. They, they modeled for us that you rejoice when it's going well and you support when it's going badly. And that, like, in, Unbelievable. Well, like in my family, there, there's, I have a sister who skipped a grade. I have a brother who was held back a grade. And... The other brother was telling me, you know, our parents could have celebrated the the one who skipped or the one who was held back. Oh, why can't you try harder? Never did that. Wow. They just accepted the kids for who they are. And, you know, none of us was, you know, the role modeling was that you celebrated everybody. Yes. And you rejoiced for the good and supported for the for the unfortunate parts wow so your your family your parents were absolutely amazing and you're super blessed and that is kind of like i want to talk about your other stuff too so i'm going to like push forward and that's really kind of led you because you talked a lot about service and giving back so i want to talk about um your other book which is the tips to help combat sex trafficking exactly because that is such a big thing that is really come to light now and what was the book it was it was 52 things to look out for 
Uh, it's 52 Tips for Combating Human Trafficking. Okay, so how did this book come about? It came about because on April 11th of last year, 2019, uh -huh. I heard a lecture that completely changed my life. I mean, it just, my life is before April 11th of last year and after. Here's what the lecture was. It was a man who was telling what I hadn't really understood was that sex trafficking, there's a brutality to it that I hadn't imagined. He was telling about 12-year-old girls <sighs> who are violated like 12 times a night with complete strangers. Uh, and that's 365 days a year. And yeah, the, the really awful part about this is that like only 1% of these children are rescued. So most of them, what the end for them is, their average life is seven years. And it's suicide or overdose. So seven years or, once they get, once they're trafficked. Once they're trafficked, their their life expectancy is seven years. Oh, my gosh. But can you imagine uh, you know, overdose, suicide, murder, or disease? And I'm thinking, this this is the most monstrous thing I'd ever imagined in my whole life. I mean, I don't know if you're like me, but I sort of, my view of prostitution was sort of from this very unrealistic movie Pretty Woman, where it seemed sort of glamorous. No. Right. You know, children, in fact, I was talking with a woman today who, I mean, she deals with kids who are six years old who are being trafficked or who've been trafficked. Uh, it, and so, as I said, it's, I couldn't unhear this. I'm, I'm, yeah. And I'm sitting in the audience thinking, this is the most monstrous thing I've ever heard of in my life. The suffering is just inconceivable inconceivable and so there are 40 million people in the world who are being who are victims of human trafficking and i get this figure from the united nations and that by the way imagine every man woman and child in california which has approximately the same population mm -hmm. that they're all in slavery okay so i'm sitting in the audience listening to this guy speaking his name's paul hutchinson and i'm sitting in the audience thinking OMG, I want to do something mm -hmm. about this. Right. Uh, yeah, if there's that much suffering, I, 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 I can't be the same person. Yeah. So, you know, ideally, I'd love to write a great big check. But in fact, uh, if I write a great big check for, for his foundation, that means cutting back on other charities that I'm already deeply involved with, you know, like I might be on their board or, you know, things that, that for years I've supported. Right. And if I, if I cut back them, you know, I know that, that it would be hard on them. You know, it might mean fewer staff or something. Yeah. And I didn't, you know, I'm sitting there in the audience thinking, who could I cut back? And I can't think of one that, that I would like to cut back on in, in order to do something about this thing that seems to me, you know, the, becoming the most important thing in my life, doing something about that kind of suffering. Right. Well, I'm sitting in the audience, and I'm thinking, but I own a chest. Actually, it's a desk that we believe, and I'm ready to be proved wrong on this, but I believe it was owned by a de' Medici cardinal from the year 1600. Oh, my gosh. It, it has the insignia on it of de' Medici. It, it, pe people who can read heraldry tell me it belonged to a de medici cardinal and because it's old and because it's historic and because it you know it came from my family uh -huh. it occurred to me actually i had an idea of what it would be worth and i also know what the speaker paul hutchinson said it costs to rescue a little girl and i figured this chest if i were to put it up for auction there's a chance it could save a hundred little girls Oh my gosh! And I'm thinking, you know, I love yeah. this chest. It's it's you know, it's got all sorts of family memories. But you know, if you weigh and sort of like a balance, a uh, hundred girls saved from suffering. I know a chest. Uh, guess which <laughs> which exactly. one? Exactly. So how much is it to? What is the cost to save one girl out of trafficking? Uh, if it if you're going through the Child Liberation Foundation, it's two thousand dollars. Okay. And it, by the way, that's that's you you won't get the same figure from from everyone, right. but that's in that case. Okay. And so what what it um, the fifty two tips? Can you go through some of those so people that are listening, if they're at an airport listening, where there's a lot of stuff going on, they're getting gas in their car, 
what can they look out for to help prevent this that's in the book? Okay, the the book is 52 tips, but one of the things that, that I emphasize over and over again is you can see signs of trafficking. It doesn't mean it is trafficking. Oh. It's got, there's there's got to be like maybe three or four or five things that make you pay attention. Okay. And uh, in a way, I don't want to give one or two because I don't want people to think, oh, she looks undernourished and she's wearing the wrong clothes. Um, or she's got a tattoo that uh, that makes you wonder. Yes. Uh, there, I mean, there. When you have to sort of look at the whole picture, and therefore, okay. uh, and I think I'd give away my book. But if you want to get it, uh, it's on Amazon, and go for look up Mitzi Purdue, and Purdue is spelled like chicken. Uh huh. And and you'll see the book. But but to repeat myself, I don't want to give like even two or three tips because it's it's a whole picture that makes you worry. Okay. But the the amazing thing is once you know like. 20 or so things to look for. Your eyes get opened and things that you wouldn't even notice normally. But it I think it I think it takes training and some study to to really be effective at this. Well, here's the other here's the other thing too is you know, if I witness this let's say I'm at an airport and I I witness something who where do I what do I do? Who do I call? Like I can't go up and say, "Hey, pervert, let her go." Yeah, and I, 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 they'd probably kill me. Okay, and that's actually almost the first piece of advice. Okay, uh, leave it to law enforcement. Leave it to people who are trained. It is not your job to intervene. Okay, and here's why: you know, partly because you're worried about getting killed, but on top of that, it can put the victim in danger. Oh yeah. That's a good. That's a good point. But but people who are trained know how to handle it and, and know yeah you know, what's likely to happen. So you just call the law enforcement and just I, say I see something a little suspicious. Yeah, and and actually I'm hugely in favor. Of, I've I've heard experts in this field say when in doubt speak up because very often, you know you you get what I call a spidey sense. Remember Spider Man could could sort of feel things. Well, if your spidey sense, in addition to everything else tells you that you know this really doesn't look right yeah oh yes by all means and then there's also the uh the anti-trafficking hotline and i haven't memorized it but it is in my book okay but uh but what i'm doing what when i told you about this 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 desk that i'm ready to put up for auction Mm -hmm. it occurred to me that i bet there are other people who have high value things that they would put up for auction Right. So I went to Sotheby's and said, if I could get you 30 or 40 items in the million dollar range or more, would you, for the sake of anti-trafficking, yeah, this one time, would you be willing to forego your normal seller's commission? And for the sake of anti-trafficking, the answer is yes. And so, oh my God, that's awesome! So I now have donations that you can hardly believe, but I'll allow me to tell you like a couple of them. Sure. I've been raising. I've I've been working on this anti-trafficking auction, not only in the United States but also in Europe and South America and Asia. The biggest donation so far comes from Taipei, Taiwan. Uh huh. There's a jeweler who inherited a sixty-nine carat ruby that belonged to a Qing dynasty emperor. Oh my gosh, what is that worth? Uh, I've heard estimates of 30 million. That that doesn't mean it's accurate. This is somebody right. who... That's going to save a lot of kids. Yeah, well this man, he's elderly and he hates uh, trafficking. Yeah. And he wanted me to have it. And by the way, um, I'm going to make a guess that you've never had a 69 carat ruby in your hand. I don't even think I've had a one carat ruby <laughs> in my hand, to be honest with you. <laughs> Well, I don't it, think I have. <laughs> well, it's somewhat smaller than a golf ball, but it makes you think of a golf ball. Really? Is it just so beautiful? Uh, it's it's sort of jaw-dropping. I mean, you can't... Uh, yeah. And actually, a funny thing, uh, he gave it to me. He said, you know, I could have just walked out with it. But I was thinking, how do you get that through customs? <laughs> well, right. It, so how did it get to this? Uh, he still has it. He he wrote me a great big long document in both Chinese and English and with all sorts of seals and things. And I asked Sotheby's, you know, how do we get this thing? Because I don't want to have a $30 million thing, no. you know, even going to the taxi <laughs> or staying at the hotel. 
and they said they 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 absolutely know how to transport these things. I suppose they have armed guards or whatever mm-hmm. they do. Yeah. But other things that have come in, one of the world's more perfect uh, emeralds, emerald large emeralds. There there are all sorts of huge emeralds, but they're full of flaws. This is one that was found from the sunken treasure ship Atocha in 1622, and it has almost no flaws, and it's quite large. Wow. And, and, and there, there are other just wonderful things. There's a necklace that we think belonged to Marlena Dietrich, the movie star, uh-huh. and it's appraised at a million dollars, and it's, uh, it's diamonds and large sapphires. But there are all these people who want to do this wonderful thing, which is, oh, let me tell you where the money goes, and this is the most important thing of all. Yes. The donor gets to say where the money goes, because I'm not going to spend the money. I don't have any kind of knowledge of, of how to stop trafficking. Okay. My only area of expertise is to help fund them. Uh-huh. So any anti-trafficking organization or anybody who cares about anti-trafficking, if they can find an item that's ultra-high value, million-dollar range, Okay. Uh, if they'd contact me, and I'll give my address in a moment. I mean, I'll give my email address. Uh-huh. Uh, wow. if, if they have such an item, we can do something spectacular for them because we can convert it into cash, which then goes to the organization of their choice. Oh, wow. So in the trafficking area? Or it's it's got to tra- be... It's got to be trafficking, but I view trafficking prevention as being extremely important. Absolutely. So supposing you're providing jobs, supposing you're providing education uh, for, for or people. Or mentorship for the foster kids, too, so they don't get trafficked. All of that. Yeah. Uh, anything that helps make people less vulnerable, because the traffickers, what they really want is vulnerable people. Mm-hmm. And so anything that makes people less vulnerable is eligible. And I also include law enforcement in this because law enforcement is fabulous at attacking trafficking. Right. So if somebody had something fabulously valuable that they wanted to say goes to law enforcement, I'm all for it. And is that the winthisfight.org? Winthisfight.org. So that's where they can go and they can find out more about these auctions and how to just donate if they don't have an item that they're going to – can they still donate? On the Absolutely. website. Oh, that's great. So there's no like minimum, like whatever they can do. What whatever they can do. The what if if they donate it to winthisfight.org. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, I, I'd almost rather that they contacted me directly. Okay. Because uh, we are revamping the website right now. All right. So uh, what's your email where mine they is, can reach out to you? Okay, mine is Mitzi M I T Z I. Uh huh. At winthisfight.org. Okay, perfect. So, so contact me, and uh, I don't know, like four or five weeks from now, we'll be absolutely totally set up for, for donations. Oh, that is amazing. I just love that you, you know, you obviously grew up in a very amazing, privileged, wealthy household, but you really, your parents really instilled amazing values, which made you such an amazing person. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. I mean, I'm so honored to have met you. And, you know, thanks to our amazing producer for putting you on the show. And this was just such a fun conversation. Well, I've sure loved every second of it. Yeah. And I loved all those nice things you said. I, I, I feel as if I've got a duck and that they go over my head, but I love no, it. Thank you've you. got great energy. Don't change. <laughs> thank you, you. You are absolutely great. And can they find your father's book at all? Like if they went on online or? Uh, the, you can find it on, uh, it's very frequently for sale on eBay. On eBay. Okay. Because he sound, sounded like he had amazing business advice. And then your other book you can find on Amazon or? On Amazon, yeah. And that's that one's the family, keeping wealth in the family or how to yeah. keep the family business together. Yeah. I mean, you'll. Okay. I think there are like six or seven books of mine on Amazon. So oh my there, there's a menu of. Well, I'm a writer by trade, so I love it. I absolutely love it. So we'll go, we do have to wrap up, but um, I'm just so honored that that you were here. You guys, please look at Mitzi Purdue. Uh, you can contact her as well if you want to join in on the fight to combat uh, sex trafficking, which is such a big, big um, thing, and we can't fight it unless we're together. What were you saying? Oh, I just wanted to say that I would love to have volunteers. Whatever your skill is, we will find something that you will find satisfying, and I promise you the ride of your life. Well, you can sign me up. Yay. I would love to get involved to help you on some some level. 
I will. <laughs> so, yes, we will talk for sure. So, you guys, Mitzi, thank you so much for being here. And you guys at, at home, um, thank you so much for listening to another episode of Next to Madison. And we'll see you guys next time to find out who's next. Hi, your host, Madison Malloy here. I just wanted to remind you guys to please follow the show on social media at, at Next to Madison. And if you have any questions or suggestions for the show or you feel that you would be a great guest on the show and would love to be considered, please feel free to email me at next to Madison at gmail.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on all podcast platforms. And I thank you again for listening. <laughs>